Well, the 96 Academy Awards are very much in the rearview mirror now. There were so many wonderful wins that night, and nominations too, of course. But like every year, especially in the acting categories, there were some serious snubs. What are some incredible performances from 2023 I think should have been nominated at this year's Oscars? Hi, it's Brian. Welcome to the Awards Contender. And we have finally arrived to my last video about the 2024 film award season. I felt like it was time as we are moving into April and May. I just, I can't make a thousand videos about the 96 Academy Awards. And so I made my top 10 best and worst Oscar nominations of the year. I just did an Oscar fiasco video about May, December. And in the weeks to come, I'm going to be making retrospective videos about Oscars from years past, like The Matrix at the Oscars, the year that Lupita Nyong'o beat Jennifer Lawrence for Best Supporting Actress, and coming your way, in just a few days, I am finally returning to Meryl Streep and the Oscars. Yes, to celebrate Meryl Streep's 75th birthday this coming June, I am finally concluding this series with parts 5 through 8 between now and mid-June, so keep an eye out for that. If you are a Meryl Streep fan, you are in for a treat. But before I move on from the 96 Academy Awards, I had to make one more video, the top 10 acting Oscar snubs of 2023. So for this video, I have two rules. I can only mention a movie once. So if there's a movie I love, I can't just give it slots one, two, three, and four, actor, actress, and so on. Only one performance from each movie gets mentioned in this video. And then for slots number five through number one, I will give you the nomination I would swap out. Let's start with number 10, Best Actor, Zac Efron, The Iron Claw. Make me feel a little worse while you're at it. No, 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 sorry, no, I, uh, I would love to go out with you, Pam. <clears throat> so to be honest, one of the things that bummed me out the most this past award season was The Iron Claw getting pretty much completely overlooked I mean, I didn't love the movie as much as others did. I did have some problems with the narrative as a whole, but the acting is very strong throughout, and I thought that Zac Efron dramatic performance was phenomenal. I mean, he's always been a good actor. He hasn't had much of a chance to stretch in many of his roles throughout the years. He's done a lot of comedy, and I do feel like that's what he's most known for, and what was so cool about the Iron Claw is that it proved if you can get an actor we kind of know for a certain type of thing into a perfect role suited for him or her and they take it on with gusto, a performance you never really saw coming. It can be very exciting for audience members and that was me watching the Iron Claw. I mean, I've always had a crush on Zac Efron since his hairspray and high school musical days when I was younger. I, yeah, I was into this guy. <laughs> I thought he was just the greatest thing. And I mean, I enjoyed many of his films throughout the years, but I never really saw him as a potential Oscar contender. But I thought his performance in The Iron Claw was that good. It is a very physical performance as well as an emotional performance. I have not stopped thinking about that last scene. I wish it had been nominated at one of the big telecast award ceremonies for something like Zac Efron for Best Actor. I mean, I get why he wasn't nominated at the Oscars. Best Actor was way too competitive this year. Same thing with SAG. But I do feel like there was room for Zac Efron at the Golden Globes or Critics' Choice, like one of those two. He should have popped up somewhere, given the Iron Claw some kind of recognition. I really hope Zac Efron has more films and performances like this one in him in the future. Number nine, Best Supporting Actress, Taraji P. Henson, The Color Purple. Come again. Celie is coming to Memphis with us. It's time she saw more of this world. So one of the big question marks for me this past awards season was, first off, why did The Color Purple crash and burn so hard? I thought it was a really great movie. I had a wonderful time. The cast is amazing. The cinematography, the music, it wasn't perfect by any means, but I enjoyed The Color Purple quite a bit. 
And for that film to only get the one Oscar nomination in Supporting Actress for Danielle Brooks, I mean, that was something, but boy, for many, many months of 2023, most of us, at least some of us, thought that The Color Purple was going to do much better at the Oscars, not necessarily do as well as the 1985 film version by Steven Spielberg, but like, not getting into picture or any other acting category or best sound or best costume design, like only getting into supporting actress for Brooks was surprising to me. Also, I mean, I loved Daniel Brooks in the movie. She's very good. But I thought the MVP, I thought the best performance in the film was Taraji P. Henson. I felt like her character was in more of the movie, had more emotional weight overall, and in a career of so many excellent performances like The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, which did get Henson an Oscar nomination back in 2009, and also Hidden Figures, which she's terrific in, that did not result in a Best Actress nomination. But I thought this year in Best Supporting Actress, which was a category, kind of all over the place, there was room for Taraji P. Henson to get in there at least somewhere throughout the season. Like for her to just never show up at the major televised ceremonies was shocking to me. I thought at SAG she could maybe get in and even at the Oscars, especially because she had that previous nomination many years ago, I wouldn't necessarily take out Brooks, I like that nomination fine, but to Raji P. Henson in The Color Purple, she should have been more competitive too. Number eight, Best Supporting Actor, Dominic Sessa, The Holdovers. You hit him? What, like punched him out? Nope, I hit him with a car. You got kicked out of Harvard for hitting a guy with a car? By accident. All right, so this was a nomination I was feeling pretty confident was going to happen. Supporting actor basically had four locks this last season. We had Robert Downey Jr. and Ryan Gosling and Robert De Niro. And I would argue Mark Ruffalo was kind of a lock even though he didn't get in at SAG or at BAFTA. I just felt with his previous three Oscar nominations and his wonderful performance in Poor Things, that was going to happen. So there was just that fifth slot and there was room for a surprise, maybe somebody who hadn't shown up very much this past award season. That slot did of course go to Sterling K. Brown for American Fiction, but I thought Dominic Sessa had a pretty good chance of making it in. I thought, okay, if they go all in on the holdovers, it gets into not only picture and actor and supporting actress, but also let's say director. If Alexander Payne makes it into director, if the film shows up in any technical categories, it did get into film editing. I thought Dominic Sessa had a chance because it is an amazing feature film debut. I mean, that guy just exploded onto the scene. He is so charming and natural. I can't wait to see where his career will go. And he did have that BAFTA nomination, so it didn't seem outside the realm of possibility. I just think his chemistry throughout the movie with Paul Giamatti and Devine Joy Randolph is off the charts. I loved his humor and his emotion. What a great actor Dominic Sessa is. He was perfectly cast in The Holdovers and I do think would have made for a great Oscar nomination. But there's another 2023 performance I think would have made an even better Oscar nominee in this category. Number seven, Best Supporting Actor, Milo Machado Grené, Anatomy of a Fall. Enfin, moi je me demande même d'ailleurs comme si t'as pu entendre les voix. J'étais juste en dessous de la fenêtre ouverte en fait, donc j'ai entendu. Enfin, je sais, je sais ce que j'ai entendu. Why does the Academy and awards voters in general seem to hate child actors? I think one of the best performances of the year was by young Grené in Anatomy of a Fall, who just knocked me out in several scenes in that movie. I know all of the attention was on Sandra Huller, as expected, she got into Best Actress almost everywhere, and I do think she was so powerful in that movie, she kind of overshadowed everyone else. But you know what? Sometimes the Academy will do the right thing, especially for a movie they love that gets into Best Picture and Best Director and Best Actress and wins original screenplay 
and nominate an astounding child performance in that movie, Milo Machado Grene is so focused and superb and has a couple moments at least to really shine, like in the courtroom, like when he thinks Messi the dog is dying. Again, Best Supporting Actor was very competitive this award season. I feel like slot number six at the Oscars was probably Willem Dafoe for Poor Things. I mean, if Dafoe can't get in for a movie that got 11 nominations, where he got in at SAG over Ruffalo, like it was going to be very difficult for the child from Anatomy of a Fall to break in at the Oscars, but I still think he is amazing in that movie and would have been a very worthy Academy Award nominee. Number six, best actor, Nicolas Cage, Dream Scenario. I've got a book. Uh, do you have a publisher? Well, I, I want to finish it before I take it out. I don't want to be influenced by any sort of corporate agenda. So as I've said on the channel before, I do think Dream Scenario is the most underrated film of 2023. I got it on a screener and wasn't expecting too much. I felt like the buzz out of Toronto was solid, but not over the top. I wasn't hearing a lot of rave reviews about the film or Cage's performance. So I was expecting like a seven out of 10 kind of a movie. And you know what? I went nuts for this thing. I thought it was so creative and daring and bold. And I thought Nicolas Cage gave his best performance since Adaptation more than two decades ago. He was so believable as this ultra nerd professor who lives a very mediocre life and doesn't have a lot going for him. And then suddenly when everybody in his orbit starts having dreams about him, he becomes a mini celebrity. I thought the concept of the film was impeccable. And then where the screenplay goes in the second half was so fascinating to me and dark and twisted. And Nicolas Cage, every step of the way, found the right notes for this character. It is a spectacular performance. I'm happy he at least got that Golden Globe Award nomination for Best Actor in a Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy. But there should have been more. There should have been more Cage nominations. Again, like Supporting Actor, Best Actor was crazy competitive, and it was really hard to break in there. I mean, by the time we got to SAG and the Oscars, we kind of already knew our top five. And Cage has won before. He got Best Actor in the 90s for Leaving Las Vegas. He was even at the 96 Academy Awards giving his speech to Paul Giamatti. But yeah, I have said it before and I will say it again. If you have not seen Dream Scenario, check it out. It's now available on Max. It is a fantastic film with a memorable Nicolas Cage lead performance that I do think in every way was Oscar worthy. All right, number five is Best Actress, Margot Robbie, Barbie. No one on the Supreme Court is me. I'm not good enough for anything. I know she got an Oscar nomination for Barbie in Best Picture, but it was kind of upsetting that Margot Robbie got into Best Actress throughout basically the entire award season. She was nominated at Golden Globes and Critics' Choice and SAG and BAFTA. And then on Oscar nominations morning, she did not show up in Best Actress. And it felt kind of wrong, especially because Ryan Gosling got into Supporting Actor and America Ferreira got into Supporting Actress. But the lead of the movie, the title role of the film, she's so great in Barbie. Like a big reason why that movie works as well as it does, of course, the ensemble cast and that screenplay and Greta Gerwig's impeccable direction. But that Margot Robbie performance is pretty spectacular. All of her comedic and dramatic shades. I mean, she's had two great performances in the movies in the last two years I thought were Oscar worthy. Not just Barbie, but also Babylon. And it is kind of disappointing to know she still only has the two acting Oscar nominations for I, Tonya, and Bombshell. Like the I, Tonya nomination is fantastic. I love that one. 
bombshell, on the other hand, you can kind of take it or leave it. It doesn't seem right that she's nominated for bombshell, but not in Best Actress for either Babylon or Barbie. Now, some might argue Best Actress at the Oscars was also too competitive for Robbie to get in. They were never going to nominate a performance like that. I mean, I guess that argument holds weight, but I do think there was room for Robbie to get in, and this might be controversial. I don't know. Many people adored this performance, and there is a lot to like about it, but I never understood why Carrie Mulligan got in everywhere for Maestro. I thought it was a very solid, dramatic performance that, at the end of the day, isn't super memorable. And, like, would everybody be crying if Mulligan had been snubbed on Oscar nominations morning in favor for Margot Robbie in Barbie? I don't think so. I think people would have been okay. So yeah, for me and Best Actress at the 96 Academy Awards, I would take out Carrie Mulligan for Maestro and replace her with Margot Robbie for Barbie. Number four, Best Supporting Actress, Rosamund Pike, Saltburn. I loved living in a bed set in my 20s. It's so freeing to live all in one room and much less cleaning to do. Mm. Oh, but it'll be terrible when you're gone. How will I cope? I know you must be very sad, right? That this is the last time I'm going to talk about Saltburn on the channel, at least for a long while. I mean, I guess I could make an Oscar fiasco video about it, but I don't know if there's much to say. I think we all kind of know why it didn't get in at the Oscars. Many people hated it. Even though it got in at Golden Globes, it got a Best Picture nomination at Critics' Choice, it got into a few categories at BAFTA. Part of me knew after SAG snubbed it completely that Oscar just wasn't going to go for it. I thought if the actors are not on board this movie, it's probably not going to be a big Academy Awards favorite. I mean, all the way to the end, I thought maybe it can get like a technical nomination, like be an Oscar nominee for something. For me, if this movie could have gotten one Oscar nomination, it was for Rosamund Pike in Best Supporting Actress. I completely adored her comedic supporting role in that movie. I think she is so funny in Saltburn. What this amazing actress can do with a great one-liner, with a look on her face, she is so fantastic, and I wish she had more than just that one Oscar nomination for Gone Girl, which is almost a decade ago now. I loved her in I Care A Lot, and then she just stampedes like a force of nature into Saltburn. I love her chemistry with Barry Keoghan and with Carrie Mulligan, who's also very funny in Saltburn. I do feel like at the end of the movie, she gets to show some more dramatic shades, not just comedic ones. And I just think it was one of the most memorable performances of the year, what Best Supporting Actress was made for. I think this category was made to recognize and support and celebrate great supporting female performances like Rosamund Pike in Saltburn. This would have been a really cool lone Oscar nomination for that movie. And I don't think it's a mystery who I would take out of this category. I made a video about her nomination. I do not hate this Oscar nomination, but did America Ferreira need to get that Oscar nomination for Barbie? I think we could debate that. At the Oscars, I would take out pretty easily, I would say, America Ferreira for Barbie and replace her with Rosamund Pike for Saltburn. Okay, number three, Best Supporting Actor, Charles Melton, May, December. I think I... I didn't know what a big deal it was in a way because, you know, um, but anyway. As I just talked about in my Oscar fiasco video all about May, December, it still shocks me to this day that Charles Melton did not get an Oscar nomination for that movie. One, it was a powerhouse emotional performance, I do think, was one of the breakthroughs of the year. He held his own up against giant talents like Natalie Portman and Julianne Moore and has at least, I would say, half a dozen amazing scenes in that movie. And number two is that at the beginning of the award season, he was getting nominated everywhere 
and was even winning things, winning a bunch of critics prizes. And it just seemed like even if May, December came up short in best picture, best director and things, best supporting actor seemed like there was room for Charles Melton in that fifth slot. Maybe not competitive for any wins at the televised ceremonies, as we saw at Golden Globes and Critics' Choice where Melton was nominated, he was not going to have a chance in hell at winning over Robert Downey Jr. and Oppenheimer. But looking back now, it just doesn't feel right for May-December to have only gotten into original screenplay. It also should have gotten at least one other Oscar nomination for Melton in Supporting Actor. I think he deserved it. So many memorable moments, that scene on the rooftop with his child, the scenes in the bedroom with Moore are so affecting and raw and emotional. The expression he has on his face at the graduation ceremony took my breath away. This was one of my favorite performances of 2023, and Charles Melton should have gotten that Oscar nomination. Now, who do I take out? There's really only one. One person who got into supporting actor I didn't necessarily feel had to be there, and that was Sterling K. Brown for American Fiction. I love that movie, he's very good in it. But was he better in that movie than Melton in May-December? I don't think so. I was never emotionally affected by Brown in American Fiction the way I was with Melton in May-December. I mean, it's tough. There were so many great supporting actor performances in 2023, and there's only five slots at the Oscars, so not all of them can make it in. But this year, in this category, at the 96 Academy Awards, I would take out Sterling K. Brown for American Fiction and replace him with Charles Melton for May-December. And number two, best actor, Andrew Scott, All of Us Strangers. Do I scare you? Huh? So I don't know about you, but for me, all these weeks later, it still hurts my heart a little bit that all of us strangers got zero Oscar nominations. What the hell happened there? How did this incredible film released at the end of the year that did very well at the film festivals? I saw it at the Telluride Film Festival. The room went nuts for this movie. For many people leaving Telluride, it was their number one film of the weekend. And although I never ranked it that high, it just barely missed my top 10 of the year. All of Us Strangers was number 11. I do think this wonderful movie should have gotten at least two Oscar nominations. Best Adapted Screenplay for Andrew Haig and Best Actor, of course, for Andrew Scott. He got in at the Golden Globes, which was something. I was so happy he got that nomination at the very beginning of award season. But then the movie just kind of faded. And even at BAFTA, where All of Us Strangers was recognized all over the place, it still couldn't get Andrew Scott a nomination in Best Actor there. Like WTF, how do you recognize All of Us Strangers in a variety of categories but then you snub Andrew Scott in lead actor? Like that made no sense to me at BAFTA. The best thing about the entire movie is that Andrew Scott performance. It's so vulnerable and raw and authentic and emotional from one scene to the next. His scenes with Paul Meskel are so tender and romantic and his scenes with his parents are so lovely could have easily been really corny. I mean, this movie had the ability to go to sentimentality, but I do think it's Andrew Scott who holds that entire movie together and a Best Actor Oscar nomination for this very talented actor would have been an all-timer. Would have had me jumping up and down screaming on Oscar nominations morning. I know we really didn't expect a shocker surprise in Best Actor. It seemed pretty clear what those five nominees were going to be. But up until that morning on January 23rd, I was like, come on, give us something really exciting like a Zac Efron in The Iron Claw 
or even better, Andrew Scott in All of Us Strangers. He is so incredible in that movie, I will never forget his performance, and I do think there was room. Because, again, this might be controversial, I don't think of this guy as a villain, but yeah, I would take out Bradley Cooper for Maestro and replace him with Andrew Scott in All of Us Strangers. And I can't imagine too many people would have been sad about it. Imagine if on Oscar nominations morning, Cooper missed in Best Actor and Andrew Scott got in instead. I think we would have been very happy. All of Us Strangers would have gotten something and Cooper would have been nominated anyway in original screenplay and picture, so everybody wins. <sighs> All right, one left. One more snub to talk about. What's left? What do I have behind me here? Oh, my choice for the number one acting Oscar snub of 2023 is, of course, Best Actress Greta Lee for Past Lives. <laughs> That's just something Koreans say to seduce someone. This was, for weeks, the Oscar nomination I most wanted to happen. I was trying to manifest it. I was talking about it all the time on Twitter, and I just kept thinking about that Ruth Nega Best Actress Oscar nomination for Loving in 2017. That year's Oscar race in this category was also very competitive, and Nega got in anyway, even though she was only nominated, I think, at Golden Globes, maybe at Critics' Choice. Like, she did not get in at SAG or BAFTA, but she beat out Amy Adams for Arrival and got in at the Oscars for Loving. So I thought Greta Lee could do it, even though she only got in at Golden Globes and Critics' Choice and missed at BAFTA and SAG. I just thought there is so much love for past lives. There is so much passion for this movie and especially her performance in it. I thought, kind of like in Best Actor, if we could have one big shocker in Best Actress this year, it should have been for Greta Lee in Past Lives, one of my favorite performances in years. It's quiet and subtle and grounded in truth and authenticity. It's not a big, over-the-top performance, and I do think that hurts Greta Lee in the end. I mean, as I heard some people say, her Oscar moment in the movie is from across the street. We don't even get a close-up of her emotional breakdown at the end. And so, even though very deep down inside, I was like, Brian, stop. She's not going to get nominated. It's not going to happen. I just kept believing. I was like, come on. Past Lives is probably getting into Best Picture and best original screenplay, I think this amazing movie, my favorite film of 2023, should get three Oscar nominations. Greta Lee should make it. She is just so affecting in that movie from one scene to the next. Her chemistry with both John Magaro and Tao Yu is on point. You feel for her, you love her, and at the end of the movie, Greta Lee breaks your heart. I will never forget this performance. It 100% should have gotten an Oscar nomination for Best Actress, and there's no doubt in my mind who should have been pushed aside, Annette Benning for Nyad. I enjoyed Nyad more than others. I do think Benning gives a terrific performance in that movie, but in a very crowded Best Actress field, I do not think we needed to nominate Benning for a fifth time for that movie especially getting in over Margot Robbie for Barbie and Greta Lee for Past Lives. Greta Lee should have gotten in instead. It would have been one of my favorite Oscar nominations in recent years, and I would have been going absolutely berserk in my Oscar nominations reaction video. I was like, if they call Greta Lee's name, I am gonna be gone. <laughs> like, I am going to go insane. And when they announced Annette Benning to start the category, I was like, oh, okay, Greta Lee's not gonna make it. 
it was over. And so yeah, all these weeks later, it still kind of disappoints me that they went with Annette Benning over Greta Lee. That was a mistake. Past Lives should have three Oscar nominations, not just two. In Best Actress at the 96th Academy Awards, I would take out Annette Benning for Nyad and replace her in a heartbeat with Greta Lee for Past Lives. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and let me know in the comments below who do you think were the most egregious acting Oscar snubs of 2023? Is there anyone I left off the list? We'll see you next time at the Awards Contender.